everyone, and welcome to the ASSIST Community Conversation. And today we are going to be talking about the clinical examination of different types of death-related spiritually transformative experiences. Before we move on to that talk though, I want to just kind of give you some announcements about what we're working on. And um, next, the next community conversation, which we're hoping to get set up for next month, is going to be related to the assist peer support group facilitator training that we're working on and talk to some of the uh, first trainees that have gone through the program and talk to them about what it was like to go through that program, um, what the actual training brought up within them as um, they were integrating their own experiences and how the training has affected them in their own integration process. And some of them have started groups and some of them are not yet ready to start groups. And we're gonna talk about the inner process, the inner process of being with yourself that it takes to actually facilitate a space for others to be with themselves as they process their experiences and integrate them as well. Uh, so the new uh, training cohort will start in January sometime. I'm still in the process of reviewing those applications, um, but uh, it's, it's, very, it's been a lot of fun doing this training because I get to meet people from all over the world and connect with people um, in their deepest, most intimate heart space about their integration process, which is a true gift. Uh, we are having a little bit of a technical problem today uh, with getting some, our, some of our presenters on, uh, but so I want to talk about what ASSIST is. If there's any of you here that are new to ASSIST today, today we actually have about 34 people uh, signed up for today's uh, session, and some of you may not know what ASSIST stands for. Uh, we, we ASSIST stands for the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. And we support people who've had spiritually transformative experiences by providing research and education and support to experiencers. And we also support the mental health professionals that we hope will be supporting the experiencers as well. And so it's been an interesting journey um, to watch the uh, kind of co-mingling, you might say, of the experiencer uh, uh, experiences uh, with people who are also mental health professionals. And for me, that's been one of uh, my greatest kind of heart um, joys of doing work here with ASSIST is getting to support those people that support the experiencers. And here, the joys and the sorrows and the difficulties and the challenges that they experience as professionals trying to be helpful. Uh, so I want to uh, move forward and uh, introduce our, um, uh, our uh, Executive Director, Katrina Michelle. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna talk about our conference that we're setting up for next year. We're going to be in Atlanta, Georgia for our next uh, assist conference, which the current title is Therapeutic Issues of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. It's for those mental health professionals that um, actually work with or want to work with spiritually transformative experiencers. Uh, we also are in the process of getting our first retreat put together for our peer support group facilitators that have been through the training. And then in 2020, we're gonna be opening up the retreat to experiencers. But we're kind of creating that base of support for the experiencers that will be coming to our annual retreats uh, by preparing those experiencers. And um, in January, if you're a mental health professional, be watching your newsletter if you're signed up for our newsletter because we're going to be putting out the call for papers later in January. And um, if you're wanting to present, if you have research, if you have case studies of working with experiencers and things that you would like to share with other professionals, please be sure that you uh, turn in your call for papers. And if you're not on our mailing list and you want to be on the mailing list, uh, please email me, Elizabeth Sabet at info at That's I-N-F-O at 
acist.org. And once again, my name is Elizabeth Sabet. I'm the president of the board for ASSIST. And I'm gonna be turning it over here to Katrina Michelle. Um, oh, well, actually, Katrina's actually trying to get somebody on the phone here for right now. So while we're doing that, I would like uh, one of our panelists today, Dr. Craig Hogan, to introduce himself and share with us what his work has been clinically uh, with people who've had near-death experiences and death-related experiences. Uh, Dr. Hogan, feel free to take yourself off mute. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to talk with you. I'm always excited to talk about this. There's so much today that we're learning about afterlife communication, about afterlife experiences. It's a whole new world. It's really a science now. And I'm the president of the Afterlife Research and Education Institute. And we're helping people who are doing the research and people who are involved in helping other people learn how to communicate with loved ones on the other side to do their work. Because of the fact that today we're making advancements every day, we're always finding out about new methods of communicating. The important thing is that we're able to communicate easily because they're always on the other side trying to communicate with us. And they do that in, in uh, therapy sessions because they will come in, uh, as we said in one of the books that I co-authored, the dead make the best therapists. And the reason is that they're anxious to help heal the client. And so they do come through and they do have an effect on the client. And we just have to learn how to listen to them. So part of what we're trying to do is to help people learn how to listen to those who are trying to come through and work with them. Now, I've co-authored two books, uh, one with uh, a psychotherapist from Libertyville, Illinois, who's doing a procedure called induced after-death communication. He uses EMDR to do it, and he is successful about 70% of the time. Uh, when he was at the VA hospital uh, practicing, he was very successful with it. He, the traumas that the vets have make it much easier to, to induce that after-death communication. And the other book that I co-authored is with a woman from Washington State, a state licensed psychotherapist who is also an EMDR certified and Embrya certified. Uh, her name is Rochelle Wright, and she has improved upon the procedure. And now she uses bilateral stimulation, but she departs from the EMDR protocol. And she is 98% successful in helping people to have afterlife communications. Uh, so we're, we're seeing tremendous success in, in this area and people are, are being healed by from their grief by having these afterlife communications. So our role is to try to help people to learn how to communicate and then how to process that information that they get. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is going to be such a fun conversation and this excites me so much because um, I also work as a medium, uh, which I don't ever advertise in public, but I just did it. <laughs> and, and it's been something that, uh, you know, I've always kind of hid in the shadows. And I asked my teacher, Dr. David R. Hawkins, if I should stop doing that work, you know, was it a, a distraction to my spiritual path? And he looked at me and said, oh, as long as you don't allow people to, to uh, glamorize you, you're gonna be fine. Um, you know, uh, and uh, so to see it happen in a clinical setting is just so exciting to me. All right, thank you, Dr. Hogan. And we're gonna bring on William Peters now. Uh, William, if you'll unmute your mic and come on and introduce yourself and share uh, and tell us about you and your work. Yeah, so thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, good to be here this morning. Um, yeah, so I'm the director of the Shared Crossing Project, and we actually have a research initiative as well, and we study these profound and healing um, end-of-life experiences. They're called by a variety of different names, uh, spiritually transformative experiences, exceptional or extraordinary end-of-life experiences. And what our mission is really to you know, raise awareness about these experiences and educate people about how they can have them, um, what give them a context to process them, and we're we have a um, a pretty now what's looking like a increasingly significant 
uh, research study because we have captured almost 200 uh, cases and we have videotaped uh, a lot of these, about 70 of them. And what we're seeing is very significant patterns that people experience at the end of life, things like pre-death premonitions, uh, pre-death dreams and visions, uh, a, an experience called terminal surge, where just before someone's about to die, they exhibit these very enlivened um, experiences that defy their physiological state of being. And then perhaps the pinnacle experience, one that we're most interested in, is the shared death experience, where loved ones and caregivers will report that they go into the afterlife with their transitioning uh, loved one. And these experiences are extremely profound. Uh, and, and what we're also finding is that since so many deaths in North America happen in hospitals uh, or medical settings, that these settings are not equipped at all to receive these experiences. In fact, they are often dismissed, discounted, and uh, often disparaged. So this whole educational piece that we all uh, we're all involved in is essential to uh, bringing back the meaning and uh, connection and consciousness that all of us uh, desire for our end of life experiences. I should say we also study the experiences that surviving loved ones have soon after the death of their loved ones. So post-death communication and post-death synchronicities uh, really prominent as well. And if there's anything that we have learned uh, in our study, is that these experiences are far more ubiquitous than we ever imagined. In fact, people on our team, when we just ask us what we're doing for a living, say, oh, we research these experiences, invariably somebody will say, oh my God, I, I think I had one of those. So we're at the front end of this and it's so great to be a part of you know, your organization and you um, giving us this opportunity to dialogue about this. It's, it's very exciting. Certainly feels like we're at the front end of a, a revolution in understanding uh, these extraordinary experiences that happen at the end of a human life. Thank you, William. Yes, I agree with you. It is very exciting, very exciting indeed. And uh, we're going to now introduce uh, Dr. Janice Holden, who is the editor of the Near Death uh, Journal Studies, uh, uh, Studies Journal, and has been doing near death uh, studies research for decades now. Jan? Thanks, can, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so I began researching actually near-death experiences um, in the mid 80s and have been, and that led me into research on after-death communication. So uh, I've been researching that and kind of have connections to both Craig and William in that um, I uh, learned induced after-death communication and, and have just received the results of a study comparing the effects of induced ADC and traditional counseling on grief. And I mean, it's in my email box right now and I couldn't open it. I didn't have time to open it because I had to come to the webinar. So I'm just dying to see what the results are. But my statistician forewarned me that um, we had some significant um, differences with IADC being better, uh, having uh, more effect on alleviating grief symptoms with a large effect, which means um, that the, the practical significance is very big. So, um, so it's looking promising for um, kind of uh, empirical endorsement of, of that approach to grief counseling. Um, and um, I've done other research on ADC, um, including a recent study on the extent to which ADC um, fosters uh, increase in what in the Bible is called the fruit of the spirit, um, which is the sort of biblical litmus test of, of what phenomena do and don't come from Holy Spirit. So, um, so I've done that and um, I guess that's all I can think of for the moment. 
Thank you, Jan. Oh, how exciting. Maybe we'll give you a minute to open up your research. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll take me a little while to digest, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't think I can do it right here. Right, right. How exciting. Well, um, we're going to get this conversation started here in just a minute, but I want to let all of our guests that are watching today know that we will have Q&A at the end of these questions that we have for our panelists today. So if you have any questions, um, be sure you write them down and wait for Q&A. And then you can write them in the chat and I'll ask our panelists uh, for you. Um, but before we get started, I'm going to introduce Katrina Michelle. She is uh, uh, Assist Executive Director. She lives in New York City and she practices as a holistic psychotherapist. So uh, Dr. Katrina Michelle, welcome. Hi, thanks. It's exciting to be here with all of you. Uh, it was wonderful to meet all of you in person at our conference in Chicago and realize we're all talking about similar issues uh, about after-death communication and death-related STEs. So we thought it was important that we make time and space for a dialogue with all of you together. And um, today we're talking about the clinical um, clinical examination of death-related STEs and being that ASSIST uh, is working with a lot of helping professionals and learning how we can best serve experiencers. We really want to focus today on how each of your unique research interests and um, clinical interests will essentially be useful to us as therapists, as coaches in the field working one-on-one -on -one with people. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. I think we could really all use some practical help with how we can move this into our work with our clients. Um, so, okay, so I guess we'll move into our questions. You guys did a great job introducing yourselves and your work. Um, and the first question is, what findings and applications about death-related STE research are you most excited to share with helping professionals? And what resources would you like to share for those of us that are interested in learning specific modalities for use with our clients? Well, I could start. Um, what I'm most excited about is the fact that we're discovering that those on the other side are working very diligently to communicate with us. And so that we're just discovering that and now we're helping people to be open to it because the communications have been there. They've been there uh, continually in the past, but people are not open to them. And so in the clinical setting, in, in, the, in the psychotherapist session with a client, the, those who are on the other side are going to be coming through to try to help heal that grief. They want that grief healed as much as the client does. And so what we need to do then is to be open to that and understand that some of the things that are going to be coming through from the client are going to be insights that come from that person on the other side. Uh, and the psychotherapist as well is going to be getting insights from them because they're, they're, uh, they're whispering in, the, in our ear about what it is that they want us to understand. So the most exciting thing is the fact that we know they're communicating with us. We just have to find out the ways of listening and to be able to get the communications. Um, I guess I'll jump in next. Um, I'm, I guess, most excited about all the research that's happening around uh, phenomena, transpersonal phenomena surrounding death because I believe that research is going to enable a wider acceptance of these experiences. And I think the thing that, uh, I see these experiences as having tremendous healing potential. And the thing that interferes with that healing potential is people questioning the reality of the experience, uh, questioning their sanity, um, questioning how the experience might fit into their pre-existing belief system, and, and that research can help clarify um, the, all those things, the reality of the phenomenon, the fact that, that and it's an established fact now that um, these phenomena are not associated with mental disorder, 
doesn't mean that people with mental disorders don't have these experiences, but they don't have them at any larger rate than people without mental disorders. If they're equal opportunity experiences. And um, yeah, so, so that's, that's the thing to me is, is what can we do to uh, facilitate the, not only the experiences, but people's openness to receive the healing potential of those experiences. I can, I can follow up here. And, and Craig and Jan said it very well. Uh, the research is really important to, uh, not so much for the skeptics, but for the, the open-minded person. I look at, at my field as a psychotherapist, a lot of therapists just don't have the support in research when a client comes in and, and shares an experience with them. They just don't have the research to say, well, that is normal. That's what we know about. Your experience makes sense. Here's a place where you can go learn more about this. Um, the dialogue, which is so essential to processing and uh, harvesting the meaning in these experiences, in these clinical relationships, uh, the research just isn't readily available yet. I mean, we don't have enough solid literature out there. I mean, that's kind of, that is definitely a, a, one of the goals of the Shared Crossing Research Initiative, as, as is, you know, Jan's work as well and Craig's, is to get this information out there. So that's the first step. But I also think we need to, you know, take on some headwind here. Uh, and that is, at least identify what this is. And that is, we have a medical establishment in which the kings and queens of this system, i.e. medical doctors, largely don't believe in these experiences. We have to understand that this is a scientific uh, materialist-based um, institution, medical science, and they really look askance at these uh, experiences. So if a patient is having an experience in one of these institutions, they're not gonna feel supported. So this research is quintessential in at least loosening the grasp of the scientific materialistic hold on, their, on these institutions and on these end-of-life service providers. Uh, and I will say that as a mental health provider, we all, we all sit as psychotherapists under that larger umbrella of uh, medical science. And so while therapists are, certainly tend to be more open-minded about these phenomena, they need research and we need this is just a, this is something that we have to take on step by step. And I feel very strongly that this is happening. Uh, and so the, you know, the conferences that you, uh, that ACIST is offering and others like Craig's conference, um, you know, what we see certainly at a conference like uh, Craig's, the Afterlife Research Education Institute Symposium, is we have literally, you know, hundreds of people after someone like me gives a talk, come up and say, I've had this experience. You're, this is the first time I've ever had someone identify this experience. We have to eliminate that reality. People have to be able to connect their experience with legitimate research, feel supported, and actually give voice to these experiences. I am pretty convinced that the change in our system in terms of willingness to accept these experiences will happen from the bottom up. We'll provide the research, but I think our, the experiencers will push for this. They will change the medical system and healthcare by demanding their experiences be respected and honored. We just have to give them the fuel to do that. Well said. Yeah, I think we're all with you on that. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, we all want to give our clients the space to recognize the truth in this, but having research, certainly being able to point toward authority, toward scientific studies, gives all of this merit and really helps people to open up to these experiences. And, you know, like Jen said, the, the healing capacity that's here within them. Um, you know, I'm curious to ask if any of you have any specific modalities that you want to point to or references off the top of your head before we move on, uh, just to give people some really concrete suggestions. Yeah, Jen? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, one is, um, I'll, I'll give a little background on each one. Um, it, the first one is the ADC fact sheet, which is available online. So I can send you the link, um, um, Katrina and Elizabeth, that you can share with the webinar participants or really anybody. 
And um, it's a fact sheet that is the result of one of my doctoral, former doctoral students, now Dr. Jenny Streithorn, did her dissertation research a systematic review of all research that had been published on after-death communication. It involved 35 studies between 1894 and 2006, involving a total of 50,000 people from over 24 countries. And in the systematic review of all this research, she came to the first empirically based facts about ADC, like the fact that one in, at least one in three people experiences after-death communication sometime in their life, um, in the first year following the death of a loved one, the experience goes up to 75% of people and other things, the modalities, the circumstances, and all of that are on this fact sheet. And um, the other resource is a book recently published by the American Counseling Association affiliate, the Association for Spiritual, Ethical, and Religious Values in Counseling. And the book is Connecting Soul, Spirit, Mind, and Body. And the link that I'll send you takes you to a page where you can actually, you can purchase the book, but you can read it online for free. And there's a chapter in there on after-death communication, one on near-death experiences, one on past life memories, one on uh, how to respond therapeutically to transpersonal experiences in counseling, and uh, uh, as well as other chapters um, related to spiritual issues in counseling. So um, I, that's, those are two resources that I think uh, are readily available for free that uh, people can, the fact sheet can be also given to clients um, who've experienced and report ADC, so yeah. That's great. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. Um, if you want to pass that to me, I can, uh, you know, add that to our resource list and maybe we can post the links for that uh, on our YouTube channel when we post this video. Um, either of you, um, William or Dr. Hogan, have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I would like to add something to it. If we have the confidence, if you know the fact that those on the other side are trying to communicate, they want to come through, they want to help heal the client, then you can access them and all you have to do is be, before you go into a session before you uh, with your client if you just meditate and ask them to come and and that may sound a little a little woo woo but they are anxious to come and all you have to do is invite them and you have to be in a state of a mind in, in which you can accept it and then you will you don't have to do anything then you don't have to have great insights or be a medium to be able to do this although many psychotherapists are mediums uh, but what you can do is, is you will see that they will come through and they will give you insights. They'll give the client insights. They will help out in the process. So we know that that's true. All you have to do is prepare for it and be willing and open for it to happen. Uh, and so that's a modality that anybody can use. We just take some time to meditate, uh, have a little communion with those on the other side, have the confidence that they are there and they are listening and they are cooperating. Uh, they will come through and they will cooperate in, in your in your work. Uh, and then the um, as far as modalities are concerned, the IADC that Janet's been working with and the, the uh, there's another therapy method that's based upon bilateral stimulation that's called repair and reattachment therapy uh, are two of the modes that uh, if you want to sometime we can talk about those, but those are two that are very successful now with uh, clients in psychotherapy. I can say a piece here. I think one of uh, the processing, the healthy processing uh, methodologies is simply dialoguing about this. Uh, so many people come to us, uh, you know, me and I know others will say, I've never talked about this before. I've had this experience and I've never shared it before. So um, the healing for and the reception if you will the actual integration of these experiences happens uh, largely from feeling safe and supported and expressing their experience and looking around the room i think group processes are very important for this uh, where they can be honored and supported in their experience and certainly it helps when you have more than one experiencer 
uh, doing the same. Of course, you know, IANS has a history of offering these groups regionally, and I think they're really good opportunities. So one thing to think about, even as a, as a, as a therapist or clinicians who are uh, listening, is to just encourage their um, clients to go to local IANS groups and also start groups. I know when I began uh, my deeper kind of exploration of this as a clinician now almost 10 years ago, I had a group that I started called Life Beyond Death with a question mark. I just put it out in my little community of Santa Barbara. That group took off. I couldn't, I couldn't offer that group enough. 12 to 16 people gathering in a room eight weeks in a row. And they said, we had never had this opportunity to, to share like this. So I really think that the, you know, as we move along here, it may be a little simpler than we think, if we, at least initially, to really give people options or opportunities to share their experience and feel supported in it. And then it's like a domino effect. And the last specific piece I will say is, you know, our program, uh, the Share Crossing Pathways, we offer a couple times a year uh, locally in Santa Barbara. And this is a program that is designed to enable people to have shared crossing experiences, shared death experience in particular. And we have found that over 50% of our participants will have a shared death experience when they're at and around a death experience. And over 80% will have some shared crossing phenomena, which would include ADC or pre-death premonitions, pre-death dreams and visions, what have you. And I'm not so sure, to be honest, that our methods are that spectacular. I think it may just be bringing these phenomena into our awareness, as Craig has already pointed out, hold out the possibility that loved ones on the other side, or if they're transitioning, want to communicate to us. Simply bringing that into presence and into consciousness may be uh, the most important element in facilitating these experiences. We don't know. More research will tell us. Yeah, that's... That's great. It's really exciting to be uh, conduits for all of this to happen um, in the therapy room and pointing to the larger culture and the implications that we have, you know, to affect that by just helping people one at a time. So, um, okay. Well, thanks for your thoughts. Uh, Elizabeth, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yes, thank you. So uh, in assist research of the common challenges that people experience after a spiritually transformative experience, there seem to be some commonalities, um, whether it's a near-death experience or another type of, of STE. And I'm curious, um, for the work that you guys are doing uh, with people who are um, on both sides, do you notice any comment if do you notice any challenges that the person left in physical form experiences after having had the contact um and how do you help them process that and be with that well i'll jump in um i i certainly have seen people struggle with um wondering whether they've lost their sanity um, because our culture doesn't prepare people for the reality of, of these phenomena. Um, and um, I think it can be very helpful to clients to know that um, the experience, whatever it is, if it's a near-death experience after death communication, witnessing a terminal lucidity where the person, William, referred to this earlier, suddenly regains um, communication capacity that shouldn't be functional because of the condition of their brain and so forth, um, that these are all things, like it's a thing. And uh, that, that uh, being prepared to label the experiences, not that I'm gonna impose that label on someone but to offer it to let them know that this is a, a recognized phenomenon and then to reassure people that um, that there is no research indicating that any of these phenomena are associated with mental disorder is really important and and then um, 
if the person is feeling open to the experience, it's very likely that they're, um, when a, in a recent study, uh, a qualitative study of after-death communication among about 32 or so adults in Sydney, Australia, the researcher Michelle Knight found that about uh, that some of the people she interviewed, she did multiple in-depth interviews with people, and, and she really saw people falling into two categories. One was people who already believed in the survival of consciousness after physical death, and for those people, the after-death communication experiences just confirmed their worldview. The other was people who prior to the ADC did not believe in the survival of consciousness after physical death, or at least were very uncertain. And what she saw was that they shifted and became um, believers. And I, I actually even hesitate to use the word believe because it's more like these people know. They now know from their experience that consciousness survives physical death. And so that that idea, as William mentioned before, is very counter to the philosophical materialism that dominates science and medicine right now. And so, um, so just um, helping people to be able to accept their experiences and then process how the experience, what the experience um, provides for them and how it affects their belief system. Um, uh, when I lecture about um, ADC and after-death communication and grief, I, I say that in my view, grief involves three questions. One is where and how is the deceased, uh, physically deceased person? The second question is about me, how am I supposed to go on in life without them? And then the third question is about our relationship. Are we still connected in any way? And will I be reconnected or, and reunited with them at any point? And what after death communication and a lot of these other experiences surrounding death um, lead people to not just believe but know is that the um, physically deceased person continues to exist in a state of well being and um, and that we, in related to that third question, we are still connected and, um, and they continue to be concerned and interested and wanting to support us as Craig has, has indicated. And that uh, we will be reunited at some point, that this, this current difference in our consciousness um, existences is temporary and um, uh, we can still connect but not as easily and there will come a time when I move into their domain of consciousness and will be reunited. So, um, so there's a lot that, um, that people can benefit from, uh, from, from these kinds of experiences and, and what we can do is as health professionals is help people get past barriers that that um, interfere with them being able to mine the gold that's in these experiences for them. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Dr. Hogan, William, do you have anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I can say a little bit about uh, the benefits to having shared crossing are these extraordinary end of life experiences um what we have seen is uh first of all the ineffability of these experiences is something we really need to um recognize especially for a first time experiencer uh they will say things like I, you know i just don't have the words for this or i i can't explain this and i think that as clinicians uh, we need to really open a space for that reality is that there is something about these experiences that are otherworldly and a way of caring for and honoring both the experience and the person, the experiencer, 
is really to begin with a starting point of how difficult it is to articulate this experience. So that's the starting point. But what happens, and Jan referred to a term that we hear all the time in our research and others you know, who study these experiences come up with this as well. There's a knowing. There's a sense of knowing that they don't have the words to articulate. This is not about belief anymore. This is a knowing, and if you push a little hard on that, they don't have the words, but they do have the conviction. Uh, and so, in terms of specific benefits, most of the uh, most of our uh, interview, uh, most of our research candidates will say that they have a uh, a knowing about a sense that they go on, and that every person they know will go on as well. That they have a a, a realization, a touching into a substrate of existence that is beyond goes beyond human death. Uh, and they find this to be quite comforting. Uh, anxiety about death and dying uh, typically uh, is alleviated, if not ameliorated completely at that point. And, and that's not a big, like, kind of, you know, kind of a big uh, statement. I don't have any fear of death. It's really usually a very peaceful, a really calm stating of, you know, I just don't fear death the way I used to. And, and there's a comfort with it. We also see people who have uh, these experiences reporting a desire to get, in a certain way, a bit closer to death and dying. And this is very interesting. These experiences affirm life for sure, but they also affirm the meaning in end-of-life experiences. So a lot of people, alums of our programs, um, will say that they feel like they want to get closer to death. They join hospice. They, uh, as a volunteer in some form, and, and this is very um, meaningful to them. So they find that these experiences, a benefit is that they're much more comfortable with themselves, they're much more comfortable with death, they feel a greater appreciation for life. This is, this is something that we see is that people will make very significant life um, decisions. They may change careers, they may uh, change their relationships. Uh, as a result, they change them because they want to live more in integrity, more, uh, more in, with some more congruence to their, the realizations and their new understanding they uh, experienced uh, during their uh, end of life experiences. And the last piece I'll say, or I should say the last two I'll, is, one is that they feel very confident that they'll see their loved ones, their deceased loved ones again. They feel like there's a reunion that will happen at some point. They don't have a lot of texture around or specifics around how that will happen often, but they feel confident it will happen. And the last piece is this grief piece that Jan alluded to. Grief is a given uh, when you lose someone you love. Uh, so we're not, we're not suggesting that grief goes away, not at all. But the container, the context that holds this painful loss is very different. The loss somehow takes on meaning and the process is far richer and it's held in a, in a, in a sense of a, a context of continuity of life beyond death. This changes the game for uh, grief. And as a, as a therapist, I feel we're seeing, we're starting to see this more, but I think we're gonna see a radical change as these experiences come into uh, our understanding as mental health professionals. And we'll start looking at uh, not so much letting go of these people uh, there's deceased loved ones, but more I think we're going to be talking about how does this relationship transform. Human death ends a human life. It does not end a relationship. And our work as mental health professionals is to help uh, these, these grieving experiencers make sense of those transformations, integrate them healthily into their understanding of this relationship and where their loved one is in, in this new state of being. Yeah, and we're seeing that the, in the spontaneous uh, transformational experiences, uh, we're seeing it there, but we're also seeing it in the voluntary and in, in the induced communication experiences. Uh, and in, in the induced communication experiences, self-guided, because we have a self-guided protocol that we have people use, uh, or in the induced or in the repair and reattachment psychotherapy, in every one of those in which the person is voluntarily coming into this situation and is voluntarily having the experience, they're exhibiting the same sorts of, of feeling of confidence that 
their loved one is there with them and that they can communicate. All they have to do is sit in their living room and go into a, a, a relaxed state and they can communicate and that they will meet with them. They will come back into the same plane later on and they lose their fear of death. So much the same kinds of things are happening with the, the spiritually transformative experiences and these that are more planned and induced that happen uh, at will. And uh, so and we're very excited about that. We want all people to have those experiences. So we're trying to, to make these things available, these methods available to all people. Thank you so much. Uh, what an interesting conversation and how much hope. I mean, it gives me hope for people that, um, that are having these experiences that are concerned, that have these concerns and challenges, that we have professionals out there who are not only doing this work, but you're sharing your work with other professionals and educating more and more. So thank you all so much. And I know Katrina has another question for you too. Elizabeth. Yeah, so one of the things that, that comes up often in the conversations with other professionals who are open to working in this realm is, you know, taking a look at our ethical responsibilities, especially if we are licensed. And, you know, we're talking about something that is still not commonly understood. And we have to ask the question, you know, how do we approach this delicately in a way where we can offer our clients what they will be needing to facilitate their healing and their growth and still be mindful of protecting our professional reputations, protecting ourselves legally and ethically in terms of whether or not somebody might see us as promoting a certain religious worldview or something like that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that um, idea about eth ethical considerations. I think a lot of it has to do with vocabulary so that if you you can avoid the the vocabulary that is kind of woo-woo vocabulary uh, that that would be a little more risky to, to use for the client so talking about uh, uh, afterlife communication uh, and uh, any of the ramifications of it then I think you, if you can talk with them about the experience that they have as an experience regardless of where it came from uh, and then have the confidence that that experience really is something which is coming from a, a, a what we the way we term it it's coming from a special place and so that if, if we talk about it in those terms the vocabulary can help to get us around that difficulty and we can still give them the confidence that we really hear them and that they they're really having a valid experience without necessarily going any further uh, unless they're ready for it. If they're ready for it, then they can understand, they can accept the vocabulary. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Language plays such a big part in all of this. And yet, of course, it's one of those challenges is how to describe any of this in language in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Dr. Hogan. Jan, did you have a thought? Mm -hmm. a, a, a couple of random thoughts. I mean, of course, one area related to ethics is about preparation. So certainly if someone is going to use uh, a technique that involves the facilitation of these experiences, that they have been um, trained and supervised in them. And so, for example, when I learned IADC, induced after-death communication, Alan Botkin's approach, um, I brought some students with me and uh, we, we live in the Dallas area. We went up to Chicago to train and when we came back, we engaged in peer supervision uh, once a week for three months before we set ourselves loose on our clients. And so um, one of the challenges can be finding qualified supervisors um, who both have um, uh, state license cred uh, credentials and this kind of um, training. So that's, that's a challenge and that's where uh, peer supervision can be um, an alternative. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is uh, in the midst of our IADC study, uh, the grief study, uh, we had two clients who uh, 
two people who you know didn't know each other or anything, but they responded very similarly. When they started to have an ADC experience, they stopped and opened their eyes and said, I have to stop. And the counselor um, in both cases handled it very well by just saying, oh, you know, absolutely. And tell me, you know, what happened and, and um, what's going on with you. And in both cases, it turned out that the people were, um, came from very conservative, in this case, Christian um, backgrounds and believed that communication with the um, dead was uh, somehow evil or of the devil. And there, there is some precedent for that in the, in the Bible. Um, so, uh, so working with people's belief systems is important. We didn't try to um, convince people otherwise, but that was what, what inspired me to do a study about the extent to which after-death communication um, yields the fruit of the Spirit, the biblical litmus test for what comes from Holy Spirit, and the results were overwhelmingly in favor of um, that conclusion. So that could be offered to clients, but not, um, not imposed. Um, so those are two things about um, ethical preparation and then working with people's belief systems and how they interface with these kinds of experiences. I would say that um, there, the, the two sort of challenges to these experiences and people benefiting from them are, as William said, the materialist scientific paradigm on the one hand and the um, and conservative religious perspectives on the other hand. Um, and other than those two things, everything's good. <laughs> I'll add a piece here, and that is that I, I think as clinicians, when we're uh, working with our clients, we have to be very, um, very skillful in our differential diagnoses. We have to be very clear that we're not dealing with um, a personality disorder of some sort that's manifesting as a mania or schizophrenia, uh, delusional disorders, things like that. Um, you know, we do have uh, in the DSM, you know, we have a V code 62.89 that helps us identify these experiences as spiritual and religious. Uh, issues. And I, I think it's really important for clinicians to seek help uh, if they have any questions. Sometimes these phenomena will overlap uh, and you just have to, you know, it, it really helps to have experience because I think, you know, all of us who have done this work um, for a long time, uh, we certainly know how to do the, the, the certain level of differential diagnosis based on the description of these you know, uh, pathologies or symptoms or what have you. Uh, but really there's, a, there's kind of an intuitive sixth sense that comes up as well. And uh, I think that's something that we really um, need to honor in our clinicians. So it's both. Because I think you know, those of us who have worked with a severe mental illness know that when somebody comes in and they're deeply unbalanced and they're having you know some sort of psych psychological or psychotic emergency there's a feeling to it there, there is there is a way that, and that may come with you know having worked with hundreds if not you know hundreds of clients uh, so it's both it's really training this field uh, clinicians to be increasingly adroit and skillful in doing the differential diagnosis which as I said comes from you know, knowing the DSM very well, and also having a good intuitive sense, which comes from working with lots of clients, and also comes from, I think, having a um, support group. It's good to work with peers and do case review and really look at it, because quite frankly, there are more questions that arise uh, than, than responses in this work, and, and that's the beauty of the human experience, is that it's quite vast and defies our, uh, our descriptions, if you will. Well said, William. Yeah, and that's uh, that's one of the things about ASSIST. If you're able to come to the conference next year, uh, you can become certified by ASSIST as a mental health provider. Um, 
Dr. Holden just uh, helped us out with that training in October in Chicago. And William Peters was one of our certificates that's uh, now having the opportunity to meet with peers on a monthly basis to have that peer supervision and that conversation that you really can't find in too many therapist peer supervision groups. So it's a great opportunity to get involved with that. Um, Elizabeth, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Actually, Jan, it was something that you just said. You know that um, they know that people that have had the after-death communication, there's more evidence that they've, they've had contact with their loved one is in a state of well-being. Um, and I'm curious uh, for all of you in your work with these death-related transformative experiences, if you've had contact with someone who's made their transition, um, who's not in a state of well-being, that committed suicide, who has not gone on into the light yet, and how do you handle that work? And do you just, and how do you work with the one who's made their transition, do you work with them? So just curiosity there. Uh, Dr. Hogan, would you like to uh, yeah, we don't, that Yeah, uh, we don't work uh, so much with the people who have made the transition. Uh, there are some people who, who help to guide them out off of the earth plane into the light and those sorts of things, but we don't do very much with them. But uh, as far as suicides are concerned, they're met with, with compassion and love on the other side. There is no judgment they will go through their life review and they will see what it is that they've done. And they then will em emotionally feel what the other person was experiencing when they were having that episode with the other person. So they'll grow based upon what it is that happened in their life, but they don't, nobody judges them. They will judge themselves. Uh, and as far as the, whether someone is on the other side is negative, what, what we have had is we've had people come through and they're full of guilt and remorse and they want forgiveness. And they will come through and they will, they will ask the, the person, the, the loved one on this side, please forgive me. I, I feel very bad about what it is that went on during my lifetime. I didn't understand. And I, all I want you to do is to forgive me. So they do come through with that. They are sad that they're not on the same plane with us, but it's not a, a, an overwhelming remorse uh, about being sad. Uh, they, they sometimes do come through in that way, but we don't have people coming through who are vindictive, who are angry, who are uh, attempting to tell the person off on this side of life. Uh, they are very much changed in, in their perspective, and so they're on the way to amend uh, when they come through from the other side, and they just want the person on this side to participate with them, just forgive them, realize what, they, what they're thinking about their life now, and how much they love them. That is so good to hear. That makes me happy. I'm glad to hear that because that is a question people have when the death has was not an easy death, right? Uh, William or uh, Jan, do you guys have a response to that? Um, well, I just want to affirm everything that Craig just said and um, just maybe tell briefly uh, case of uh, IADC here at my university, University of North Texas. I'm a professor of counseling and so, uh, and I've had students uh, train in IADC and, and conduct it here while they're still like doctoral students. And um, we had a case where, uh, and this is a kind of uh, an important kind of story for therapists to hear about the sorts of things that can happen when you venture into this sort of work, that um, this woman's husband had killed himself. He was a veteran and uh, very troubled and um, had killed himself. And she had, uh, I, th I don't know, three or four small children. Um, so she was very angry. And uh, after a year of counseling, she finally um, took up the counselor on his offer he had made long before to do IADC with her husband. She'd made enough progress in her own grief and reconciliation and forgiveness. And when she began to have the experience of his presence, she said to the counselor, 
um, do you smell that? And the counselor's like, no, but what are you smelling? And she said, it's burning, this burning smell. And she said, it's like burning flesh. And she said, it, it just, it feels like this sense of being co consumed in um, this burning, uh, and, and the smell was so noxious to her. Um, so the counselor didn't know exactly what to do, and he just did what we're supposed to do and just stayed with her and kept um, facilitating her to stay with her, what she was experiencing. And eventually that, that passed, and then she had this feeling of elation. And she, she realized that she had experienced something that she thinks she, she experienced that her deceased husband had experienced, that he had experienced a kind of a cleansing process and then a, um, a release into uh, you know, a very positive um, emotional state. But in a way, this w helped her because as, as horrific as that, that cleansing experience was, um, it gave her the idea that he hadn't gotten off scot-free. One of the things she'd been um, angry about is, you know, he got to escape and I'm stuck with these four kids and trying to figure out how to do life. And, uh, and a lot of her anger was around that. And she realized that he had, he had some work to do on the other side and that he had done it and gotten to a better place. And um, so it was, it was very healing. So, um, um, so it, it's in part an indication about, again, what counselors need to be prepared that things happen that aren't part of even our training and that we, it just comes down to clinical experience to know how to deal with different kinds of things that can come up. Yes, and as a clinician, I can imagine um, what that kind of experience might be like for them to have to be with, right, themselves and everything that the clinician must be with within themselves to hold exactly. that space. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reason I know about it is that he came immediately to my office for supervision and, and was very grateful to have a place to go to process it himself because it was very intense for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. And um, even more reason to have this community of, of uh, professionals where you can go to to have this type of supervision, right? Because not everybody's going to have you three <laughs> to supervise them, right? So uh, yeah, more reasons for people to get involved with the system, have that monthly community. Um, William, did you want to speak to this? Question. Yeah, there, um, I'll take a kind of a wider angle uh, lens on this, and that is it's there are what are frequently called uh, negative uh, shared death experiences or negative NDEs for that matter as well. And uh, my experience is that most of these are uh, misinterpretations of the experience or a projection onto the experience that clinically can be explored and uh, reframed in a certain way uh, and, and so you know I have one example I'll share really quickly and that is uh, a woman was at uh, the death of a friend of hers and and she'd been caregiving for quite some time and she saw her her friend basically dying and, and leaving and having a pretty typical shared death experience kind of traveling up this tunnel saw light at the end and uh, it was very peaceful. And then all of a sudden at the top of this tunnel, uh, like almost like a manhole type uh, vision, she saw her two parents peer over and look at her. And she had not seen her parents since she was a young child. They had died together in a car crash. And her belief system did not allow her uh, to believe in an afterlife uh, of that type. And so she um really struggle with this and the truth of the matter is i have heard about this experience through a friend who was also part of the caregiving unit she has yet to come and see me or any other uh clinician that i'm aware of uh but she has seen her 
uh, she's just part of the religious community. And, and the religious community has been just kind of less than uh, therapeutically helpful in this, in this type of situation. So um, once again, I think that not understanding these experiences, A, that they happen, that it's very possible that in this situation, your parents were trying to communicate with you. We see this frequently. And what a great opportunity at the thinning of this veil for her parents to come through and it seemed orchestrated and had the potential to be very loving and healing, but a belief uh, was quite limiting in this case. So I, I use that as an example to say how our beliefs can be problematic uh, and limiting in, in our appreciation of these experiences so that we don't receive the healing that's available there. Uh, and then one last quick one is that we do have a syndrome um, that's well recognized uh, certainly in spiritualist communities uh, of hovering soul syndrome. There are, there are people who, uh, I would, usually with a traumatic death, will hover around uh, the scene of the death or the family or, you know, we, this is also kind of used, you know, people talk about haunted houses and things like this. I think this is real stuff. Um, but in my experience working with these, um, these type of situations, as Craig has said quite, you know, a couple times, and is that, you know, you can invite these people into conversation with you. And I have done this many times in my office, just saying, hey, can you invite this person here? And just, you know, if you don't believe this is possible, just imagine a conversation. You know, we do gestalt therapy, as we say, you open chair type, type uh, clinical um, intervention. And this almost every time, relieves just reorients that person and says you, know, you can go to the light you can you know i love you you know you can turn around uh take a look at what's around you do you realize that you're probably looking at earth all the time in your old life hey would you you know there's actually guides and um and light that you can go to and you can go on to your next uh you know next step along your your journey and often that does the trick and it does it's not that sophisticated um of a, a technique if you will it's it can be easily um, trained in, for, for therapists or people who work in this way. So, um, so yeah, there's a couple examples that may get at what you're asking about, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jen. Well, I'll, I'll just say, add a little bit that um, there's a, a philosophical stance from a counseling theory perspective that every experience, whether it comes in a pleasurable or a distressing form, has a, um, has, occurs because of its healing potential. It's motivated by a healing motive, and, uh, and the trick in therapy is to find the, um, the positive growth promoting aspect of the experience um, especially if it seems distressing and that is true for everything from nightmares to distressing near-death experiences to people even interpreting uh, experiences in in ways that they create their own distress um, and uh, i'll say that beyond that philosophical position that really um, expresses my my experience that that these that experiences that seem distressing on the face of it actually contain healing potential themselves too and and the art of therapy is to um, extract that he or get to that healing potential get beyond the the surface distressing aspects and get to the the core that is actually healing. So um, I just thought I'd throw that in. Uh, so in the um, induced after death communication and repair and reattachment psychotherapy, the often they will come through with metaphors uh, or images, and they're trying to get to a point. They're trying to take the the, the person to a point in understanding something. And sometimes those are very odd. You know, sometimes they're very strange. You know, that uh, you, you may see them, and they're they've decided they're going to ride a donkey, and you, so they come in riding a donkey, and they're going to make a point about uh, something about having to stay with it, 
you know, stay with the process. Even, even though the donkey's not moving, you got to stay with it. And we wouldn't get to the, that point of understanding the message if we truncated it. If we said, oh, that's silly, you know, something about a donkey. Uh, but we, what we do is we stay with the client and induce touch to death communication and repair and reattachment. You just say to them, now let's go back in. And uh, what I want you to do is I want you to focus on that, that memory you just had and let's see where it goes from there. And then the person on the other side will guide them through it into an understanding of what it means. Beautiful. Uh, this has been such a lovely conversation. Thank you all so much for participating. We do have three questions from our viewers and we've got a, a little less than 20 minutes. So I'd like to go to those questions. Um, the first question, um, the viewer says, I'm an experiencer. I have experiences of people on the other side wanting me to deliver messages to their loved ones. Some of these people I know and some I don't. If you were in this situation, what would you do with the information and request to pass on the information from the other side? If I could jump in, because I've actually done research on this phenomenon that we call spontaneous mediumship. And whereas most mediumship is planned, you know, like if I'm a medium, someone comes and they want to communicate with their deceased loved one, and I serve as a medium of communication for them. But what happens, uh, we know that, for example, in the aftermath of near-death experiences, um, people report that these experiences that never happened before happen now and they see dead people and the dead people want them and some of the, some of whom they know some of whom the experiencer knows some they don't know and the dead person wants the experiencer to convey a message to a living person and we've actually had a panel uh not this at the past uh the, it was in the 2017 uh, International Association for Near-Death Studies Conference, and I believe that panel is available for um, people to buy. I don't know how much it costs, maybe $15 or something like that. And in it, uh, Janie Thompson and, um, um, and, my, and Bill Taylor, who both are near-death experiencers who had this experience, talk extensively about different experiences and how they decided to handle the different situations and the kind of principles they use to guide them. So um, uh, in a nutshell, they, um, they use their, their sense of what would be best for the living people. Uh, and sometimes that means delivering the message and sometimes it means not. Um, in addition, they, especially Janie, had uh, she had she was overwhelmed by spirits visiting her they and they would visit her at all times of the day and night and she had to learn how to set boundaries and um, how to uh, protect herself from um, energies that didn't feel really um, healthful and um, and so forth so she she talks a lot about um, all aspects of that phenomenon. And um, there are a couple of articles about it now, uh, uh, probably, I'm thinking three or four articles on spontaneous mediumship experiences in the Journal of Near-Death Studies. So um, that's another source of information for this person. Um, yeah. I can add something here. Um, I relate to your to the questioner, um, I lived in, uh, in the John of God community in Brazil for two years and was you know, trained in Brazilian mediumship and the spiritist model. And uh, when I came back, I found living in Santa Barbara for whatever reason, I became a portal for these types of experiences. I smile because um, you're, the questioner may know that some of what is shared with you is really difficult to understand. Um, and I remember a, a particular case where somebody came to me who had just died and I knew the family, uh, but I hadn't talked to the kids at all in, in a long period of time. But anyway, this woman presented herself. I'll even give you the example. She said she kept pointing to her um, 
feet and I kept seeing that her feet were barefoot and you know this is you know waking up in the morning is where I tend to get these experiences in this hypnagogic state and uh and so I thought oh my god what am I going to do I don't know the family very well um so anyway I I I I said I called uh I called and I said look I have a rather it seems like a bizarre story. It seems like your mother may have come to me. I don't know if you believe this or not, but I'm happy to share the story if you, if any of one of your family is interested. Anyway, had the conversation and said, hey, she was pointing at her feet and she was, they were barefoot and she was wiggling them as if to say, look at my feet. And her fan, her, uh, the woman who I was talking to, her daughter, was cracking up on the phone and said, you have no idea for the last six weeks of her, before she died, we kept telling her, put your slippers on. Don't get, don't want to die of pneumonia. Like keep your feet covered. And they got the interpretation right away of she was free. She was alive and well, and she didn't have to wear shoes anymore. So I share this because it's really important for us as, as you know, we do, or we are like mediums or um, recipients of these messages that if you have a, if you feel safe enough and you feel like that it could be, you don't need to know the you don't need to know what the vision or the message is if you feel like you can offer it in a in a comfortable way with integrity not have to figure it out you don't have to know what the imagery is about but if you're willing to put that out there in a respectful way i think more often than not when i've done that um that type of response has, has come we don't have to know what the don't have to interpret the message but we we may feel that it's worth making the effort to deliver it. Oh, Dr. What Hogan, you're, suggest, there you are. What we suggest uh, to people is that they, that they uh, feel out the person who, for whom the message was given. And you start off by saying something like, how do you feel about uh, after death experiences or that sort of thing? And, and based upon what they say, then, then you can go to the next step and say, well, you know, I'm not sure whether I have anything that would be of value to you, but uh, I want to share it with you. Is that okay with you? Uh, and if they say, well, yes, uh, you go ahead and do it. Then you can go ahead and, and, and share it tentatively without the interpretation, just as, as uh, William is saying, just what the, the th image was that you got, exactly as you got it. And then let them make the interpretation if they want to. Uh, and they can ask for more information if they want, or they can just let it drop right there. And then you stop until they engage in, in the conversation at that point. All right. Thank you. So I'm looking at the questions here. Um, there's another question, and um, this viewer said, William mentioned how important it is for experiencers to come out, quote unquote, and share their experiences, even demand the medical establishment acknowledge and support them, but they may face many challenges. They are pathologized, disparaged, at best dismissed. So how can therapists across the country help experiencers handle their legitimate fears about sharing and um, how, over, how to overcome those fears if they've been targeted in the past? Great question. That's where the rubber hits the road. Um, I think the first realization is that you you sh you best assume that if you're dealing with the medical establishment, uh, you may not be uh, your experience may not be warmly received. So I think awareness here and consciousness about that is really effective because you know my practice. Uh, I deal a lot with people who have been uh, harmed by uh, sharing their experiences in medicalized settings and have closed up and quite frankly, until they've come and saw me, someone may refer them in that regard. So uh, it's real. Uh, there's a lot of uh, harm that has been done. Um, the specifics of the question, I think I'm, I'm not sure I'm really getting at it, but increasingly as therapists, and we talked about this in the beginning, uh, the real work is to get the research out here. It's normalization of these experiences. And, and if, you know, this person is calling up and they've had these experiences, I, I think trying, if she, it's, it's very helpful to express them. We've talked about that. Um, 
And going to these groups, these IANG groups are a great place. I mean, hopefully there'll be more, you know, assist type groups around the country. If the organization continues to grow as it is now, it'd be wonderful to be more groups that can make space for these types of experiences. Uh, but I think at this point in time, you, you best um, be cautious. Uh, and if, you know, it's, it's possible that you can have a really lovely, wonderful uh, medical practitioner. I'm not painting it all. I don't want to be perceived as painting it as all negative because you can. There are some wonderful uh, medical clinicians that can be open and receptive, but if you're sensitive, I would caution against taking that risk. These stories are mean a lot, can mean a lot to us, tend to mean a lot to us, and I think certainly if you're going to share it for the first time, really take some time to discern who's the best person to share this with, who, who truly will be open and, and receptive and caring about my experience. Well, um, I'll jump in too, and, and again, affirming what William just said. Um, and uh, I actually did a study of near-death experiencers' experiences disclosing their NDEs to healthcare providers and um, asked the NDEers if they had disclosed to more than one healthcare provider to identify the one experience they considered most impactful for whatever reason. And of their most impactful disclosure experiences, on average, the, the responses were more positive than negative. So that was kind of encouraging. At the same time, 20% uh, of people had uh, what experiences they considered to have been harmful. And those harmful experiences cut across every healthcare professional, from physicians to nurses to mental health professionals. Um, and so, uh, so there's still work to be done for health professionals to become, you know, broadly um, knowledgeable about these phenomena, how they're not related to mental illness and so forth. And um, and I, th and I think, uh, like, one of the things that comes to mind for me is uh, part of the question was how do we prepare people to disclose? I would explore with somebody what their need is to disclose to a, um, a health professional other than whoever, you know, they're talking with me. I'm a health professional, too. But if they are thinking they'd like to tell their doctor or, you know, what's their motive? And, um, and if, and depending on what that is, just work with them and, and as William said, prepare them for the possibility that they're going to be met with um, disbelief, um, with um, diagnosis. Uh, if they're disclosing to a religious health professional, like a clergy person or a chaplain, they might be met with demonizing. And, um, and how to protect themselves and, and how to decide at what point to stop the interaction if it begins to feel harmful to the person. So, um, so those are some kind of coaching sort of things that I might do with someone. Dr. Hogan, do you have any response? Anything you'd like to share? That question? Uh, yeah, we, we are seeing a change. We're seeing many people coming to realize the truth of, of what we are saying. But the, the population right now is so mixed, you can't tell what you're, you're going to run into. And so it really is important to feel out the person uh, with whom you're having a dialogue and see where they are first in their belief system before you start to, to share what's going on. And once you've done that, once you've found out where they are, then you can go to where, where they are and you can speak in those terms. You can use the vocabulary that fits where they are. Uh, you can help them to understand, help them to grow. And they may ask you questions when they realize that you're further along in, in your understanding than they are, but that they may also turn it off and say that they, they are not ready for that and, and it can be destructive for them if, if, uh, if you try to go too far. And so that I think that it's important that we find out where the, the person is 
with whom we're having a dialogue, and we only go as far as they can go, and we try to relate it to their frame of reference. And then once we've gone as far as we can go, then to stop it. Thanks, Dr. Hogan. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so we're gonna start to wrap up. We just have uh, a question that just came in from one of our viewers. I'm just gonna um, read briefly. This is for Jan. Um, Jan, this is from Stephanie. She's asking if you've observed any changes in the literature on NDEs over recent decades, um, any books, articles, or popular, popular literature you're aware of. Um, and any books written in more of a scientific nature or more biographically oriented? Anything that you know of that comes to mind? Oh, yeah. Biographically, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I'll, I guess, I don't know if this exactly responds to, I, d I have seen a shift over the, the decades from um, the question of what is it to um, is it real, to in what ways can near-death experiences be of benefit to humanity? So we've gotten past the what, what's going on here and, and even the question of reality um, to how, what, what healing potential do these experiences have not only for the individuals, which we know that people do have a lot of uh, very positive after effects, uh, ultimately, maybe not, not always immediately, um, but also for humanity. Um, so another thought that comes to mind is uh, a, a recent book published by the International Association for Near-Death Studies is called The Self Does Not Die. And it's a, over a hundred cases of paranormal phenomena associated with NDEs that were verified by a credible third party, usually a physician. And so, for example, a woman um, flat, unexpectedly flatlines in the middle of surgery, they resuscitate her, she, they finish the surgery, take her to post-op, and there she regains consciousness. Her surgeon comes by to check on her and she says, I know I died during the surgery. He says, how do you know that? And she says, well, I was up above the ceiling looking down. I watched the resuscitation process. She explained what everybody did. He's kind of amazed. But for those of us in the field of near-death studies, it's kind of like, you know. But anyway, she said, um, in addition, um, she said, because I was above the ceiling, I could look into the adjacent operating room. And there they were amputating a man's leg. And when they finished, they put the amputated leg in a bright yellow plastic bag to dispose of it. And the surgeon is like, what? And he, he said, you know, I don't even know what's going on in the other ORs of the hospital. But he went back to the hospital records and indeed a couple of hours before while he was doing the surgery on this woman, they were amputating a man's leg in the next operating room. He'd never been in that room because it was specialized, but it was empty at this point. So he went over and poked his head inside and there he saw the bright yellow plastic bags they use to dispose of amputated body parts. So um, it's very difficult to explain how this woman could have known this, except that her consciousness really was functioning outside of her body and able to perceive things that we're not normally able to perceive. So this book is one case after another like that. And so, um, so for people interested in the, this phenomenon of veridical perception where people see things during their um, spiritually transformative experience that were not the result of any sensory information they could have possibly gotten and weren't the process, anything that they could have deduced um, and yet is later verified as being accurate. Um, this book um, has a lot of those. So it's, it can be great reading for people interested in that topic. That's great. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and we're going to need to wrap up, but I know we have several more questions, and I think people are interested to engage with each of you. If you could provide um, 
website or email address where people can read more or contact you if they would like to. Uh, would you like to give that information and we can put that on our uh, website as well? Sure. Okay. Jan, do you want to begin? Oh, did you want us to say, well, my email address is jan.holden at unt.edu. UNT is for University of North Texas, dot edu. And my address is r period craig, c-r-e-i-g period, hogan, h-o-g-a-n, at afterlifeinstitute.org. And my email is william at sharedcrossing.com. And you can get more information about the Shared Crossing Project and the research initiative at sharedcrossing.com. Great, thank you. And just a reminder, there are plenty of more resources on the ASSIST website. Uh, it's acist.org. Uh, it's been a wonderful talk today with everyone. I'm really glad we were able to get us all together in this shared virtual space. And, you know, we'll be doing these conversations periodically, maybe about once a month or so, to just keep the community growing and um, there's so much curiosity out there and there's so many people who are working in the field that have some answers which of course lead us back to more questions but it makes for interesting conversation and I think together we're all moving forward and uh, creating a lot of beautiful system change and a lot of health and wellness so thanks and thank, for and thank you for organizing this Katrina and Elizabeth mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you all. And it's always great to be uh, with all of you um, yes. and, and see Craig and Jan here. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you guys are have this new, this conference already um, set up for next year. I think it's important to keep the momentum rolling here. So thank you for your effort, Elizabeth and Katrina. Yep, good. And thank you all so much. All right, so thanks to all our viewers. And again, um, we'll have this up on YouTube um, as long as the technology cooperates with me. And uh, we'll have it up by late tomorrow afternoon along with uh, these resources um, that have been mentioned today in the description section. You can get the links for all these resources there. All right, thanks again for everyone and you'll have a lovely day. Bye everyone. Bye.